Dr. Zimit. Thank you for joining me. I'm so excited to have you on my show. Nadia, it's a great pleasure. Um, I've been looking forward to this. I know we've had a lot of trouble with working out time differences, but that's also part of the circadian rhythm story, trying to get uh, between Los Angeles and Melbourne, Australia, down here, down under. And it's, it's lovely to speak to you. It certainly is indeed. How is metabolic syndrome described, Dr. Zimmer? Metabolic syndrome is what we call a cluster of a number of very important risk factors for heart disease in particular. It includes obesity, it includes type 2 diabetes, it includes actually um, high cholesterol and high triglycerides. So in, in that cluster, we have a very high risk of people having either heart attacks or strokes, for example. So that leads into the, my next question, and that is, are diabetes, obesity, and cardiovascular disease key components of metabolic syndrome? Well, that's correct. These are the, the really key factors, actually, within the metabolic syndrome. But my, I've had a little bit of a problem with the metabolic syndrome because metabolic syndrome people also have some what we call comorbidities, which are rarely addressed, actually, by clinicians because they don't think about it. These people are more likely to have a depression, to have sleep apnea, and also what we call a fatty liver. And it's, so we've actually now named this cluster, the metabolic syndrome, plus those three comorbidities. We have given it the name the circadian syndrome. I see. Because all of these factors actually are very closely related to our circadian rhythm. The circadian biological clock system within the brain functions to keep the individual organ system activities temporarily organized among themselves and with a cyclic external environment. This clock system encompasses among many functions a 24-hour active feeding, inactive fasting system. How does staying up late affect the circadian rhythm of metabolic activity and the genesis of metabolic syndrome? Well, that's a very good question, and it's perhaps a little bit more complicated. The body clock is actually uh, in the brain, but in every cell in the body, there is a body clock which synchronizes to the brain clock. So, for example, what can disrupt circadian rhythm? One is actually staying up late or reading just before bed or television, the light from that. And so we feel that bring all the things together. For example, Einstein answered the question, why do we have a body clock? And he, he said, we have a body clock so that everything doesn't happen together, that you're trying to go to sleep, that you're trying to go to the toilet, uh, that you, <laughs> you're trying to um, exercise. So we have a very well integrated body clock, which makes sure that the body functions and body metabolism follows a predictable course every day. And so lacking sleep disrupts everything, including your digestion. So is the, so is the circadian the, would you call it the master clock? Is it the, is that, how does, I guess the question is, how does everything orchestrate? I mean, you bring up a really good point, and it makes sense, of course, that eating, digesting, sleeping, relieving yourself, those are all different functions. What's happening well, biologically when, you know, which clock is working or which one pushes the other? So, actually, the, the, the body clock, the system of the central one of the brain and clocks in all of your key organs, your, your kidneys, your, your liver, your heart controls our body metabolism and our health. And it's believed now that the, the disruption of our lifestyle and this COVID-19 um, epidemic that we have now is right. a very good example of the fact that our sleep is disrupted, our eating is disrupted, our exercise is disrupted, we have stress, all of these things upset the body clock rhythm, your circadian rhythm, mm -hmm. they affect all of the metabolic functions in your body. So at the moment, we're in a very, very sort of dangerous time of human health as we start to come, hopefully, out of this epidemic. 
and get our system operating again normally in the way that Einstein says that we have to have a clock to make sure that all of these different functions of the body don't happen together. Does COVID-19, the stresses that you just mentioned, the um, sleeping, exercise stress um, changes the clock and contributes to that? Um, just in terms of pre-diabetes, can this trigger people that are um, at risk for metabolic syndrome? Just the, those, those combinations? You're, you're way ahead of me because about um, five days ago, my colleagues and I published in the New England Journal of Medicine an article pointing out that we think that the COVID epidemic is triggering new cases of diabetes, for example. And we've proposed and have established a global register now with contacts all around the world now to actually tabulate how many new cases of diabetes have arisen, actually, during the epidemic. And that also includes the fact that there will be people who do have prediabetes but don't have full diabetes, but as a result of the COVID infection, uh, actually develop diabetes. And that we also want to look over time whether those people, as we return back into a normal phase and their diets and exercise, all of those things come back into line, that in fact they may lose the diabetes. So that was a very good question of yours. Oh, that's very interesting. Thank you. Are there benefits to modulating sleep? Oh, there are huge benefits to modulating sleep. And there's a, a, a wonderful guru, actually, of circadian met metabolism uh, in San Diego, Sachin Panda. And he's made the point how important sleep, but not just sleep, sleep, a good diet, exercise, lack of stress are all very important, in fact, for our immune system. And that this is one of the ways, of course, of tackling and being prepared for a COVID-19 infection, actually having all of your body functions in line with normal circadian rhythm. A high-fat diet, altered sleep, weight cycle architecture, and psychosocial stress are all well known to precipitate aspects of metabolic syndrome. They also induced a marked reduction in brain dopamine activity. Since it's known that the circadian timed administration of dopamine agonists can block these environmental effects from an inducing metabolic syndrome, do you think the use of the circadian timed dopamine agonists to treat metabolic syndrome makes sense? Oh, you've got some really good questions. And first, I want to again stress that we're trying, I'm trying to eliminate the metabolic syndrome from yes. the medical literature through the circadian syndrome because of the additional things of the sleep apnea, the depression, fatty liver, etc. Mm -hmm. Now, there is a very strong move now to a new branch of medicine, circadian medicine, to produce drugs that help get the body align itself back into its uh, normal rhythm. High blood pressure, for example, has a circadian rhythm and is part of the metabolic or circadian syndrome. And so th the timing of high blood pressure drugs is in. Cholesterol metabolism in the body is at its highest just before the evening meal. So in fact, we should be taking cholesterol lowering drugs before meals. And the FDA a couple of years ago actually uh, approved a drug uh, with dopamine effects um, for diabetes. And in fact, as I say, there's this whole new branch now because our, our understanding of how important circadian rhythms are to our body function to be looking at the administration of drugs at the correct timing that the actual action is, is happening in terms of circadian function. Is the medication Cycloset, is that the one that they approved? That is the drug that was in, approved, yes. Oh, that's interesting. It's not, it's not used all that much yet, and I suspect that with the increasing interest in circadian medicine and this whole new discipline of timing drugs in relation to the body's rhythms is going to take on very strongly in the future. That's really interesting. So is metabolic syndrome being, is metabolic syndrome now referred to as circadian syndrome? This is what you said earlier, correct? 
I wish it was. The meeting that uh, you attended in Los Angeles, yes. the, I think it's one of the best meetings in the world for diabetes and heart disease. It's, it's run by uh, Professor Hundelsman. Terrific meeting. I never miss it. Mm. Well, so I debated there Professor Bob Eckel, who is president of the American Diabetes oh, Association. I was there. I listened to that. That's right. And he's a very close friend of mine. And um, so he was supporting the metabolic syndrome, uh, a condition that both he and I were associated with a lot of the literature on that condition, uh, you know, five or 10 years ago, or even longer. And I've turned to the circadian syndrome. So we had a, a debate, which one was the better. Unfortunately, I think the audience in the, uh, at the meeting aren't yet sophisticated enough to understand that metabolic syndrome does have certain limitations because when a doctor sees a patient with it and they don't think about the other comorbidities of depression, sleep apnea, et cetera, uh, the patient's not getting the right treatment. All they're getting is a change in medication. The circadian syndrome makes people think much more widely of the factors along with those cardiometabolic risk factors in terms of appropriate treatment. So I'm afraid that Bob Eckel won the debate. We're still great friends. I'm working I very you hard. I voted with... too. <laughs> <laughs> I voted for you though, by the way, <laughs> just so that you know. <laughs> I, thought you had, I thought your arguments were great personally. <laughs> oh, you, you, you were the one vote I got. <laughs> but seriously, this work I'm doing with Professor Cronfold Shaw in Tel Aviv, we've published a number of papers now showing in humans in relation to circadian rhythm dysfunctions. And we've also got a very good animal model for circadian dysfunction that you get, can get a combination of all of the things we see in the circadian syndrome happening, not exactly at the same time, obviously, but association. So we have heart disease, we have diabetes, we have obesity, we have people with sleep apnea, we have people with depression, and of course fatty liver is something we see very frequently in diabetes. And all of these things are actually linked through abnormal circadian rhythm, which for example can occur right now during this COVID epidemic. Well, I would imagine that, I, I guess my what I was thinking as you were speaking, what about people that are uh, shift workers, say they work graveyard, how are they affected by the circadian rhythm? If they're taking melatonin to regulate their sleep, then does that still, does their clock still function well? It's just that they're on a different clock system? I don't know where you worked out all these great questions from, but that is one of the... That is <laughs> Thank you, the that's a real compliment from you, Dr. Zimmet. I'm just, uh, I have a curious mind. <laughs> uh, no, it's a very good question. It's one of our major society problems. Mm. The, the actual... People on shift work, and there's a wonderful study, the Women's Health Study um, from Harvard, that shows that nurses, for example, on shift work are much more likely to get diabetes and have heart disease. It's a very important factor in, what, in workplace safety, that people who are working overtime, for example, their rhythms get out of balance because they're on shift work you know, shift work for years, and melatonin may help a little bit, but that's not the problem. The problem is that we have to work out actually much more sensible working conditions. And, you know, a lot of people in factories and such like that, they lose fingers, they have all sorts of injuries, mm -hmm. which actually relate to the fact that they're working overtime and, or not necessarily, working in different hours, of course, Right. And not in synchrony, in synchrony with with light and daytime. Not only very harmful from a health point of view, but economically, it's a huge problem uh, for national economies. Since low brain dopamine and altered brain circadian organization are culprits in the development of depression, do you think that the close association of depression with metabolic syndrome can be Part via loss of circadian peak dopamine activity? I'm not right into the, uh, the biology and the physiology of this. What I would say, though, that it's a very big problem that we have to 
we need a lot more research. One of our problems, people don't understand that uh, their lifestyle affects their circadian rhythms and that in fact, it's a major factor in many of the chronic diseases, diabetes, obesity, heart attacks, stroke. And we think that we need a lot more education, starting even in the schools, that people understand the whole concept of the circadian rhythm and it's important. And I think that we've still got a lot to learn about it. There's a lot of science in circadian rhythm now. Last year, they've cancelled the American Diabetes meeting this year, it's just finished, and it was virtual. Last year, I went to the American Diabetes meeting and in San Francisco, and I went to the symposium on circadian rhythms, and all they talked about were rats and mice, and not enough about humans and about the mice who actually, if you put them on an aeroplane and they went from one place to another, did it upset the rhythms, etc. And we need a lot more application of our basic knowledge on circadian rhythms in the animal models uh, and applying them to our human lifestyle. When you say the ideal lifestyle that people need to be educated, what's the, what's the ideal lifestyle that uh, well, well, support a healthy metabolic circadian <laughs> syndrome? Well, well, Sachin Panda makes the point how important a healthy lifestyle is to our immunity, right, okay. tackling and dealing with, 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 with infections, etc. People, everyone has different lifestyles per se, but it should be regular. And most people, I shouldn't say most people, a lot of people wake up exactly the same time in the morning, they have their breakfast at the same time, their lunch at the same time, their dinner at the same time, they go to sleep at the same time and get enough sleep. And that helps their immunity and their health. And it's pretty simple, actually. And Panda actually has pointed out that in relation to the an episode now like the, the COVID epidemic, the importance of people having appropriate sleep, have an appropriate diet, have enough daylight, not to live in the dark, but, you know, the normal daylight patterns, proper stress management if they've got problems. And a hell of a lot of people have lost their jobs in this particular a pan epidemic and uh, are isolated from families in countries because they're not allowed to travel and also the lack of exercise. My wife and I go for a walk for about an hour every day. We didn't do it before the pandemic, but we'll be doing it from now on. And these are the very simple things. Every person, every person in an appropriate situation. There are many areas of poverty. There are countries where it's not possible to do all of these things. But these are the basic things needed um, for a healthy lifestyle. So good, yes. I, I wrote an article about uh, COVID-19 in the immune system also, and I, I there's definitely- you must, you must send a copy to me because I'm doing a lot of work in the COVID <laughs> area at the moment. And, okay. Um, it, it, I'll, it, I'll it, send you the, the few that I've written. Yes. And I'm, I'm very big on, well, I'm someone that really, uh, I have, I don't have regular hours. So I'm someone that can go to bed anywhere between midnight, 10 or four in the morning. Yeah. So I really, um, I really make sure that my immune system is strong by eating well and taking all kinds of supplements and exercising and I try to compensate in other ways for it just because my most creative time is in the evening when everything is really quiet. Sure. Otherwise, I'm just too distracted during the day. I understand. And we've all got our own patterns, but the idea is to have a regular pattern. I mean, right. that's, that's, and then, that's I, the and key. I, I'm concerned because I do come from four generations of type 2 diabetes. So I'm always really uh, hyper. I feel like I need to be hyper vigilant. Well, you know, there's some evidence... And in terms of uh, the conditions we're talking about, for example, depression, and we're going to look at it now in terms of diabetes, mm -hmm. that people uh, with depression uh, and other mental health disorders, some of them benefit actually from light therapy and not from medication. Uh, and so, you know, this is a very exciting area. I think it's very much untouched. That's really interesting. So light therapy is something that they're looking at? And that's yeah. really... Oh, that's uh, it's already being used in, in depression. And uh, one of my sons, I've got two sons in medicine. Both of them are pretty smart, but that's a proud father. And <laughs> one of them was 
saying to me last night, we were discussing this, I'd be very upset if someone looking at your program pinches the idea from us. Uh, he says, you know, all these people who do this sun tanning and these sun tanning right. you know, yes. clothes and whatnot, that actually it would be very interesting to assess what other effects outside getting a better suntan is having on their health. You know, it does it actually right. affect? And he says some people come out of these sun tanning tanks and say, oh, we feel terrific. You know, it's like, anyhow, that's a, that's a new experiment that someone may get a Nobel Prize for. Well, I know there are a lot of studies that show exercise also helps with depression. And yeah. I know for me, since COVID-19, I've been gardening a lot. Like I probably yeah. spent four hours outside today. And, and it is nice and sunny and I do feel great. So it's, it, it is really interesting how light can really make a difference. And well, I was up in Scotland. I was up in the Highlands um, in February for February to March. I was up there for a month and it's, you know, it's always darker and colder. And literally you're at four o'clock, you think it's eight o'clock. And I'm always shocked. I'm like ready to get in bed. You know? <laughs> it's, well, I, have to, I have to go for a walk or do something else because it's gloomy and dark. And uh, it really does change my circadian rhythm there. Uh, absolutely. I did my postdoctoral studies in London. And during winter, you know, all we had was a, a skylight in the laboratory and it got dark at four o'clock in the afternoon. Right. And boy, you know, all of a sudden your mood changes, you don't know, feel like working, et cetera, et cetera. So it just shows you how important light is and the greater understanding. You know, we just don't educate children, even most adults, to understand how important the circadian rhythm is just for their general well-being and prevention of chronic diseases. Right. And with children specifically, with all the gaming, that's an issue because children don't go out as much as they used to. You used to run yeah. out and get on your bicycle, go to the pool, meeting people, doing some hiking, yeah. swimming, some kind of activity outside. And now it just seems like with the gaming, the kids are up all hours until two or three, four in the morning, just gaming, and then they yeah. sleep in. I have a few more questions for you. How does the circadian rhythm neuroendocrine activities impact peripheral metabolism? Well, again, that's a very important point because as I mentioned, every body cell has its own little circadian clock mm -hmm. and they're all tuned in to the main body clock and disruption of that body clock can disrupt you know the peripheral clocks and uh, for example there's a very strong relationship with the you know the kidney and circadian rhythm and the liver and circadian rhythm and um, basically pretty simple story actually overall when i say simple the story is simple the way it actually acts we still have a lot of research to do on it. I go to bed at night sometimes saying, you know, how come because I'm reading late at night or something, all of a sudden during, you know, next day and other days, my, you know, body functions, what's the biochemical or the, and the physiological mechanism involved right. between a silly thing of sitting up late at night and watching television and reading and all the poor metabolic effects it has further down the line. A thing called the pineal gland right. at the base of the brain. Right. And it, it actually is also the factory for making our own melatonin. Right. And it's affected by, you know, our behaviors that, you know, when you actually read at night or, you know, or watching television, it's actually can prevent the melatonin rise that would normally make you go to or help you go to sleep. Uh, and, you know, kids who are reading or watching television, you know, before going to bed, for example, their own body's melatonin production can be reduced so that they don't get the normal flow of melatonin from the pineal gland that would help them go into sleep. I have uh, one last question for you. Uh, does age play a role in both the circadian organization and metabolic syndrome? Again, that's a, it's a very good question, and we have to learn a lot more about it. But there are suggestions and some evidence that, in fact, disorganized or disrupted circadian syndrome 
can contribute to the development of cognitive dysfunction um, and also with Alzheimer's disease. Thank you so much.